Welcome to our last Lenten worship. As we enter into Holy Week next week, this is our final Wednesday service. Tonight we're going to be talking about worldly eyes, the eyes of the world as we look upon God and as we look upon his son, Jesus Christ, and his passion, and how so many times it doesn't make sense to us. Tonight, as we begin our worship, I would like to ask you to pause this video, and I would like you to collect a few things. First of all, if you could collect a piece of paper for each person and a pen or a pencil, that you would uh, collect a pair of scissors, crayons, colors, pencils, or markers, and then finally, if you have a printer, this would replace the piece of paper, but you can print a crown cut out from this website that's on the video here. And then finally, a candle and a lighter or matches in order to begin our worship and set the atmosphere for our worship time. Thank you. Pause the video now. We begin our worship tonight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Tonight I'd like to share a few readings with you. The first one, recorded in 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The second reading is recorded in John chapter 18, beginning with verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it, it to you about me? Pilate, Pilate answered him, I am a Jew. Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be, be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this, is, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Our gospel reading is recorded in Mark chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation, and the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer. And so Pilate was amazed. And at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man that you call the king of the Jews? And they again cried out, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace 
That is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. At this point, I'd like you to sit around at the table, or if you're by yourself or with one other person, to either ponder or to discuss the following questions. On your piece of paper, I would like you to draw and cut out a crown, or you can use the cutout template that you got off the internet. And as you cut out and color and decorate that crown, I'd like you to discuss these questions. In your mind's eye, what makes a good king or ruler? How would he dress? How would he conduct himself? How would he look? And in your mind's eye, what would you expect Jesus to look like? How would he dress and conduct himself? How would he look? Pause the video now and discuss those questions. So I'm curious, what does your crown look like? And if you were to make a real crown for a king, what would that crown look like? Would it be made out of gold or another precious metal? Would, would it be bedecked and, and bejeweled with all kinds of precious stones, with, with diamonds and sapphires and rubies, sparkling and bright? Would it, you make it look rich? Would it be big? Would it be small? I would imagine that none of your crowns look like this one. I'm quite sure that none of you would make a crown out of thorns. But this is the crown that they made for Jesus on that, good, that first Good Friday. And so I'm going to ask you a question. What does a king look like? In your mind's eye, what, what does a king look like? What does a ruler look like, a member of the royalty? How do they behave? How do they conduct themselves with, with dignity and, and honor? Do they conduct themselves with, with uh, a sense of pride? And how do they dress? Do they dress in everyday clothing or, or would they dress in something that is made of fine linen and fine cloth, expertly made by the best tailors? What kind of homes would they live in? Would they live in homes that would fit in our neighborhood? Or do they live in homes that stand alone, massive and beautiful, filled with precious things from around the world? What kind of causes would they take up? Causes to benefit themselves or, or causes to benefit the people for whom they work? the people they serve? And what kind of politics would they have? What political stance would they, would they hold? Would it be the kind of political stance that is expedient, that, that takes care of immediate need, or would it be something that's right, that would stand the st test of time? You know, we're pretty enamored with royalty, aren't we? When you think about it, we speak a lot about royalty. We, we're enthralled with them. We like to watch them on television. I, I did a little research for our message tonight. Do you know what is the most watched television broadcast that is not a, a, a game or a, an athletic event? Do you know what that, that broadcast would be? It was Princess Diana's funeral. And right behind it is her wedding to Prince Charles. And right behind that is their wedding, the wedding of their son, Harry, and his bride, uh, Meghan Markle. The fact is, is we are enthralled with royalty, aren't we? And when you think about it, we really like to watch them in the headlines. 
the recent headlines involving the same royalty is that Prince Charles was diagnosed with COVID-19 and he's doing well. At 71 years old, he's finished his quarantine and he's back on the road to health. And just yesterday, Prince Harry, their son, and his bride, Meghan Markle, announced that they were saying farewell to their fans because they had announced that they were leaving the royal family, not the family itself, but they were putting royalty behind them. They no longer wanted to be considered part of the royal family and uh, to do, put on the trappings and the behaviors of royalty. And this shocked the world. Why did it shock the world? Because that's not how royalty acts, right? That's not what we in our mind's eye would consider to be appropriate for royalty. We're enthralled with royalty and we have a perception of what royalty should be like. And this is nothing new. We see the very same thing happening in our scripture reading today, in the passion story of Jesus. The night before this event, Jesus had been taken captive in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was betrayed by a friend with a kiss. He was taken captive and carried off into Caiaphas's home. There he stood trial before the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. Witnesses were brought forward to testify, but a strange thing happened. The testimony kept contradicting itself and they couldn't find anything to stick. But that didn't matter. They were convinced that this man Jesus deserved to die and they were going to make sure that it happened. So the next morning when the sun rose, they took Jesus before Pilate, the Roman governor, and there they made an accusation that this Jesus claimed to be a king and that he had been teaching the people that they shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, the emperor of Rome. I was wondering when the chief priests and the religious leaders left, and Pontius Pilate was left alone with Jesus, I wonder what went through his mind as he laid eyes on Jesus. As he laid his worldly eyes on Jesus, what was going through his mind? Now this term worldly, I looked up what that meant. There are two ways in which worldly can be applied to a person. The first is this. A person is known to be worldly when they're, they're wise in the ways of the world, when they know how to relate with other people, when they're adept at, at communicating effectively, but when they're able to be socially acceptable and socially uh, intelligent. When somebody's able to climb the ladder and understand how to work the political system, they're considered to be worldly, and Pontius Pilate was all of that. He couldn't have become the governor of Rome a Roman governor here in Judea, if he wasn't politically savvy, if he wasn't worldly. He knew how to sell himself and sell his ideas so that he could climb that political ladder. There's a second way that worldly can be applied to a person. And that's when a person is more inter interested in the things of this world rather than spiritual things when they're more interested in what, what's here and now rather than what is to come after death. This would be a person we would call more worldly rather than being religious. And Pilate was that too. We saw that in our, our gospel reading from the book of John. When Pilate talked to him and, and said to him, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, I am not of this world. And he told him that he came to testify to the truth. And Pilate just dismissed it and said, what is truth? As though there would be more than one truth, as, as though nobody really knows what truth is. And so he just dismissed it offhand, not interested in that. So what kinds of eyes did the pilot use as he looked at Jesus? When I was a child, I remember vividly the, the pictures that my Sunday school teachers would hold up as he or she would teach our class the Bible stories. I'd like to gaze upon a few of these pictures as we can contemplate the eyes, the worldly eyes with which people looked upon Jesus. The first one is this a picture of Pontius Pilate and Jesus alone. 
I wonder what was going through Pilate's mind. As he looked at Jesus dressed in, in a common man's clothing, bound before him. I'm wondering if Pilate was thinking something like this. There is no way this man is a king. No king would be dressed like this in a common man's clothing. And if this man was a king, wouldn't he have followers? Wouldn't he have servants? Wouldn't he have an army behind him that would defend him? Why would he be taken captive so easily by the temple guards of all people? There is no way this man is a king. You see, Pilate was looking at this man through worldly eyes, and Jesus did not fit the pattern. And what about these folks, the crowd that was gathered before Jesus and the religious leaders that are there inciting the, the, the mob mentality that was going on there? What were they thinking? This man told us he's the Messiah, the Messiah, the promised Savior of God that he had promised we've been waiting for for centuries. Who is this man that he would call himself a Messiah? Shouldn't a Messiah be a strong man, a man with political connections, a man who uh, leads the masses, a man who is charismatic and people follow? Look at him. He's alone, standing there before the crowd. He's docile. He's not powerful. This man is weak. This man is alone. This man does not lead the mighty masses. He didn't fit their worldly view. As they gazed upon him with their worldly eyes, this man did not fit their pattern either. And another picture. This one of the soldiers. Jesus had been sentenced to be crucified, sentenced to death. They finally had their opportunity to get their hands upon him. And a whole battalion, roughly 600 men, had gathered and they saw this man, he was no king. After all, a king would wear royal clothes. This man isn't wearing royal clothes, we'll give them to him. And they took a royal robe, a purple cloth, and they put it over his shoulders. And then they looked at him and said, well, a king should be wearing a crown. And so we'll give him a crown. And they wove a crown out of thorns and they thrust it upon his head. Oh, this man, if he's a king, he should have an army. And an army should walk by and salute him. And so they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. They were mocking him, spitting upon him, striking him. Jesus didn't fit their worldly view of what a king should be either. All of them, they misunderstood. None of them saw Jesus for the king that he was. They didn't understand who Jesus really was. Jesus had said over and over again, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And then he turned to Pilate that day, and he had said to Pilate, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. And then he said to Pilate, for this purpose I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into this world to bear witness to the truth. The truth. Jesus came into this world to bear witness to the truth. He came into this world not to fight the battles of a king. He didn't come into this world to, to make sure that his name was printed in the annals of history forever. He didn't fight a battle or a war like any other king could, because the battle that Jesus was about to fight, the war that he was about to wage, was a war that no king on this earth, no worldly king could wage, no worldly king could even hope to win. The spoils of his war was, was not a country or a crown. You see, Jesus came to bear witness to the truth, and this is the truth, that this world is broken. This world is filled with despair, the effects of sin. This world is filled with hurt and pain and suffering, and we hurt one another. The truth is that we are sinners and we are in need of a Savior, and Jesus came to be that truth. 
He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He came to deliver us from, from the truth of sin and the effects of sin. He came to be our truth that leads us into the gates of heaven, to give us life eternal. And that is the truth. And why was Jesus, why was it necessary for Jesus to do this? Because no earthly, no worldly king could do it. Jesus was the only one that could take the sins of the world upon his shoulders and carry them to the cross. The sins of the whole world, of every person, you, me, and the sins of the whole world, anyone who ever existed and anyone who will ever exist. He was the only one that was able to march through the gates of hell and then march back out. He's the only one that was able to rise from the dead and empty his grave, bringing life out of death. There's one more picture I would like to show you. One more set of eyes I would like you to ponder. And these are the eyes of Jesus as he looked down from the cross. What did his eyes see? Certainly he saw the eyes of the crowds as they looked up at him. And he saw the, the religious leaders who were leading the people in mocking him. He saved others, let him save himself. But when Jesus looked at them, he didn't look at them with, with eyes of hatred and anger, eyes filled with revenge. Instead, he lifted his eyes to his father and he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Certainly, he saw those that deserved to be on the cross much more than he ever did. The, the thief, one on the right and, and one on the left. Those that had committed great crimes. Certainly he heard the one as, as he mocked him too. Save yourself and save us too. And the other one rebuking the first. And then certainly Jesus heard that second thief say, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus turned and looked at him with eyes filled with compassion, not contempt, and said, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Certainly Jesus must have seen his disciples in the shadows, beyond the crowd, looking on with horror, all of them in hiding except for one, John, the beloved disciple who was with Jesus' mother, Mary. And he didn't look at him with disappointment or hurt. Instead, he, he looked at them with concern and compassion, and he said to the young disciple, behold your mother. And to his mother, he pointed to the disciple and said, behold your son. Certainly he must have seen perhaps in the distance, Pontius Pilate glancing his way every once in a while, curious about the events on the cross and what was going on out there. Certainly he must have seen you and me as he gazed off into the distance. Certainly he saw all of mankind and then he lifted his eyes to his father in heaven and he cried with a loud voice, it is finished. The battle had been won. The war had been waged and won and we were the spoils of war. And when our Lord Jesus looks at you, he looks at you with love and compassion and forgiveness. What does a king look like? Behold the king. Having heard the word of God and convicted by the fact that it was our sin that took him to the cross, I'd like to invite you to spend a moment of confession taking a look at the times when you have taken your eyes off of him, or taking a look at the times when you have looked at him, but looked at him through worldly eyes, 
eyes that want to paint him the way you want him to be, to want him to act the way you want him to act and do the things you want him to do, those times when you fail to trust him and his ways. Let's take a moment of silence and confess our sins before him. It's my pleasure to announce to you that your sins are forgiven. Because when our Lord Jesus went to the cross and was nailed to that cross, he did so out of love for you and out of obedience to his Father. And when he looked down from that cross, he saw you and he looked upon you with eyes filled with love and compassion and forgiveness. And because he did all this for you and for me, again, it is my pleasure to announce to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we do come to you and we beg you to forgive us for those times when we've taken our eyes off of you and looked to this world for benefits and for love and for all the things that bring fulfillment. And when we come up empty, Lord, we come back to you and we confess to you that there are times when we then also look to you with our worldly eyes, wanting you to fit our mold, fit our desires to do things our way. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for those times and that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit that we might keep our eyes fixed on you as our Lord and our King, our Savior, and our Redeemer. Dear Lord, we also pray for our world, for doctors and nurses, first responders and police officers. We pray for all of them that you would keep them safe, that you would bless their work, and we thank you for their efforts and for their sacrifices for us. We pray for our leaders and our government officials. And we ask you, Lord, that you would guide them, that they would make good decisions, that they would do what's best for our country, that they would seek your will and your guidance through prayer and through your word to make decisions that are godly. And Lord, we pray for those that are providing necessary services to serve us all, for those that are allowed to stay in business so that we can eat and we can be warm and well-fed. We pray for our church, that we might be the mouth and the hands of Jesus, that we would have eyes for those in need and that we would have hands to serve them. Lord, we pray for the sick, for all those that are affected by COVID-19 and other illnesses. We ask that you would lay your healing hand upon them all. Especially we pray for Dave and Jim, Evie, Jeffrey, David, Dick, and Phyllis. And Lord, we pray for comfort, for Julie and her family at the death of her mother in Wisconsin. Lord, be with them all. Comfort them, bless them, heal them, and assure them that you are their God who has eyes only for them. All these things we pray, Lord, as we pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you, smile upon you, and assure you of his love and forgiveness. And may the Lord lift his eyes upon you and bring peace to your heart and your life. Amen. Please join me and listen to the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Have a blessed evening.
troubled soul All the broken pieces that you hold Turn them over Give them up And then watch what Jesus does Thank you.